Just 20 years ago, a fledgling network was launched with tried and true programming from the earlier days of television. I loved Twilight Zone. I loved Outer Limits. They freaked the bejesus out of me. Spreading its wings, the network picked up beloved series abandoned elsewhere. The three of us had looked at the gate for the first time and went, whoa, check this out. This is huge. Sliders, some of them continued on almost indefinitely, like the Stargate brand. It was Stargate SG-1 that helped establish the fledgling sci-fi channel as a new voice in original programming. Stargate, which began on pay cable on, on Showtime, ran for five years, totally respectable run. Showtime was done with it, but the people who made the show and the fans who loved the show weren't done with it yet. And so Sci-Fi comes in and says, we'll provide you a safe haven. We had two lives, two full lives, really. Uh, five years is a long time for any television show. You get beyond 200 episodes, you're in rarefied air. The fact that we moved to a new network gave us a, a renewed energy. That network now was invested in us that helped boost the show. The reruns played really well on the Sci-Fi channel. There was a point in time in season six, seven, where we were, we were the show that was on Sci-Fi. <laughs> if you clicked to Sci-Fi, chances were Stargate was on. We came in at a time that they were also going through some transition, growing in terms of their own internal machine and figuring out not just how to produce a show, but also how to market a show and get a show like ours out on the air. It was such an ambitious show from a production standpoint and from a creative standpoint. It took a little while for us to figure out what we could and couldn't do and also figure out the tone of the characters. There was always fun to be had among the group and it really translated through the shows. I can remember when we first started how Rick was playing O'Neill. When Richard Dean Anderson became Jack O'Neill, the idea of doing a completely straightforward, serious military science fiction series went out the window. Because Rick doesn't do that. They're not human. You think? Rick is Rick. He is funny. He just can't help himself. He wasn't going to take on that kind of level of stoic arch character for any length of time because that's just not him. Sometimes I just look at him and go, what are you doing? Like, but he, from day one, got that the O'Neill character had to have a sense of humor. He wanted to drag his character over in that direction to be more this sort of humorous, goofball kind of, you know, airhead. The Jack O'Neill character was slightly befuddled, but still, you know, very much in command and would maybe ask me to explain things a little bit further. And, you know, by season seven, he was like, what? 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 That was kind of it, yeah. It was definitely a tongue-in-cheek kind of show. Once he started to take license and improvise, and it gave the other actors, the only thing we could do was improvise, because we're off the page now. With Rick, the script was kind of just like the expiration date on milk. It was just a suggestion. He was going to say what he was going to say and do what he was going to do anyway. In the middle of my backswing! So we might as well make everything else work around him. You could play these great gravitas moments as an actor and then he would say something flip she wouldn't let me go back and watch the cubs win the world series we were that close to the giggle all the time just below the surface i got the giggles a little <laughs> <laughs> got it. have as much fun as possible tell as many jokes keep in touch track each other up and in the process if the day happens to get done so be it yeah, despite the fun when the show changed networks, Michael Shanks didn't come along. There seemed to be less and less a place for the character, and I thought, you know, it's a good time to part ways. I said to him on our last meeting, I said, look, here's what we're going to do. You're going to leave in a way that you can come back. We understood Michael's decision and where it was coming from, and then found a way to make it work to bring him back. Daniel was resurrected naked. Um, <laughs> it was like Rob Cooper's uh, payback for me leaving the show in the first place. March 3rd, like in the morning in Vancouver, where there's frost on the ground. I have no idea how many times Daniel actually died. I pretty much have died in three quarters of the things I've been in, but Daniel himself probably died. It's definitely over 20, but I'm, I'm not sure the entire head count. We joked about him being nicknamed Kenny from South Park. Oh my God, we've killed Kenny! Daniel just kept descending and coming back, and we just kept finding new ways to kill him. A lot of them died a lot of times. It's the beauty of science fiction. And the designers of most of those deaths were the colorful villains.
the main thrust of the show for the longest time were the gold. A race of people we believe were called the gold. Go old. Really? Impossible to pronounce. Every guest star who came on the show said it different. It was like Gould, gold, go old, go old. It was, just became this joke. Who was going to pronounce it? The go ha I, No one could ever say it. I was like, well, I called them the Gould, but they were like the go ha Go ha Chris Judge can say it a lot better than everybody. Like, go ha The pronunciation of uh, anything go ha or, or Jafar was, uh, was kind of up to me. Technicatels? Talk you in the Go old. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The villains that were most fun, of course, were the replicators. He had Apophis. The hilarity of that character is he almost suffered as many indignities as Daniel did over the course of the show, with his glowing eyes and <laughs> voice. Hey, Pops. Silence! Kind of comical a lot of the time. Costumes. This is very... I mean, you know, a drag queen's dream. Later, we uh, had a new nemesis called the Ori. They weren't as kind of comic booky as the Go Out were. We had Julian Sands played. He was really cool. In the latter season, we had Adria played by the lovely Marina Baccarin. At the end of season seven of SG-1, the producers had a plan to continue the franchise. The, the end of season seven was a, a lost city, which was sort of an introduction to Atlantis. With a few adjustments, it could have been a, a series finale. It's very rare for a show to go beyond seven seasons. Very rare. We had conceived a complicated scenario in which we would essentially hand the ball off from SG-1 to Atlantis. Never in a million years did it occur to us to try and produce 40 episodes of television a year. When we pitched Atlantis, in fact, I thought it was as a transition. They said, we want both. And we went, are you crazy? <laughs> it's the same, these are the same guys. We make both shows. And they said, can you do it? We kind of thought about it for two seconds and said, sure, of course we can do that. I was actually going to move to Atlantis because we didn't know if we'd be renewed. Daniel and Jack's first interaction in that show was to pass the baton over to these people and take all the sort of build up that we had done for the first seven years and hand it off to them and, and have them take the ball and run with it to Atlantis. The two shows managed to coexist for three years on the same lot. Can't believe we managed to do that for three years, but we did. After 10 seasons of SG-1, they pulled the plug on the flagship series. We actually found out while we were filming the 200th episode, which other than that was like the most glorious week we'd ever had on set. It was just a magical week. And then we find out we're canceled. <laughs> that show biz. <laughs> That's amazing. And every year we were sort of blown away that we kept getting picked up. And when it was finally over, it was like, what? That's no way. Come on. It was the end of a large chapter of a lot of our lives. He had made sure that they boarded it so that the last scene of the last episode was going to be shot on the last day and on the last in the last shots. Everyone just gathered in the gate room as the team went through the gate for the final time and a lot of people were quite choked up. I just bawled the rest of the day. I mean, it was ridiculous. Michael and Christopher and I snuck upstairs to the briefing room, just the three of us, and we stood there and we kind of put our arms around each other and went, well, that happened. At the end, I mean, it was truly just a, a, a collective celebration of, of what we had accomplished. Stargate Atlantis would continue for two years more, but even after that show was canceled, Stargate wasn't dead. Universe was born out of a desire by MGM to have another Stargate-branded series. The network wanted it to be a different show. This is not your grandfather's Stargate. They wanted something more visually different, more viscerally different, less the adventure that Stargate was and more of a drama. Whether that was a mistake or not, I'm, I'm still not sure. It was still Stargate to me, and it was still a very strong show. I'm very proud of SGU. We wanted it to feel like there was genuine jeopardy and human struggle and maybe a little bit a little bit more reality maybe it wasn't the best mix of franchise and tone but you can understand why they did it because Battlestar Galactica had created so much noise we were honestly weren't trying to be Battlestar Galactica oh, the level know. of sophistication in the character relationships this was something that we all wanted to do Stargate Universe only lasted two seasons but the crew of SG-1 also soldiered on 
We knew at some point we were going to do the movies because I think that was the thinking even from the pilot that we wanted to do these episodes and then start doing movies. Continuum and Arc of Truth had been incredibly successful for MGM. We expected to do one or two a year of each brand and just grow it out that way. An unforeseeable thing happened. The bottom fell right out of the DVD market. It was interesting that you could take that name Stargate and create different shows within the franchise. And it was just a completely powerful brand for sci-fi. And it's on television constantly. Just flip the dial, Stargate, 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 Stargate. We were a show that parents could watch with their kids, where those kids are now have their own kids. They have introduced their children to it. I cannot tell you how many mothers and daughters or fathers and daughters come up to me and say we watched your show together that was our family night dads who would say you know my daughter was really inspired by your character we never were going to say okay done we're all going home now we were never going to do that because we like to imagine that there will always be a stargate program somewhere happening even right now even though there's no stargate on the air somewhere maybe on the other side of the moon is a base where sg1 whoever they are are off doing their thing that's where the character lives in my imagination, is continuing to travel, continuing to, to journey and go on those adventures. The, the strong female protagonists continue with the groundbreaking show, Sanctuary. Sanctuary got started on the web, and honestly, our very naive idea back when we started it was that we would have a multi-platform website. We would have a show, merchandise, a gaming component, and a social networking site, all combined into one happy multi-platform. Sanctuary was the first series to use fully virtual sets. On average, about 70% of the show was shot against a green screen, and so everything was rendered in afterwards. I mean, it was all over the world, and we were able to go to Egypt and, and still be in stage one at Norco Studios. This freedom allowed the show to do things a TV budget may have otherwise prevented. It was not just that we had these crazy great characters in this wonderful steampunky gothic kind of place, but that we did revisionist history. Everything normal was abnormal, or everything abnormal was normal. So to have Nikola Tesla be a vampire, to have James Watson be the real Sherlock Holmes, to have the invisible man, that it was trying to reach a different demographic, that it wasn't just saying, science fiction but to open it up and make it more about what defies imagination you know anything is possible and sanctuary definitely fit into that sanctuary was about astounding beings living in secret 